Yeah, I was at the network, at the building, the CNN Turk. So around, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at around 10.30 in the evening, soldiers came. Like, but by saying soldiers, it was just five young guys. Uh, you know, they were young and inexperienced. They got into the building, they were kind of shaking. They, were, they had guns in their, hand, in their hands, but you could see they didn't know what they were doing, probably. That was the impression that I got. So they were saying, like, cut the lives, stop the lives, stop the... And then nobody took them seriously, to be honest. They were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then we kept on going. Uh, but then police came. We saw police, and I was like, oh, now there's going to be a clash. So I was a little timid, and then police came too, and all of a sudden, at, around at the same time, right after the police came, I don't know how these people were organi organized, but pro AK party groups started coming in, in front of the channel, and I'm not their favorite people. Uh, so I was just, there's the, the, the five uh, young soldiers uh, in the channel, police coming to raid and I tried, you know, getting out of the, out of the building. So what happened is just as I was getting out of the, the gate, uh, I saw the crowd, they were like yelling and almost running to the network, like in, in a huge group. And I saw a police guy, probably he saved me, he said, don't look back, directly run to me. And he took me and then he led me to the car park, like behind the, behind the building. And then this crowd raided the channel, AK Party supporters, and to be honest, they kind of looted the place a little bit. They stole some computers, uh, some, you know, TV sets, whatnot. But then, of course, you know, it was said that these people, the people, saved uh, the, the channel. But no, I mean, that wasn't the case, basically. There was a police operation. And basically, you know, supporters of... Or, people who were saying they were supporters of the AK Party kind of looted the building. The police, uh, was they attacking the soldiers or yeah. were they working together with the soldiers? Or? No, no, no. no. They, they, police came, special forces, and they arrested these five soldiers mm. who tried to, you know, whatever, took, took over the, the ch channel. Did the police cooperate with the crowd outside, the AK Party crowd? Um, the crowd were cooperating with the police, in a sense. Very interesting. Uh, did you have any chance to talk with any of the soldiers? Oh, no, no, to no. chat I, with them? No, or? no, no. I, no, I didn't. I didn't. We didn't really talk to them. Mm. It was just our, like, uh, the manager, the manager said, the editors who are, like, weren't, like, leading the live, no, nobody listened to them, basically. Mm. So they didn't actually know why they were there? Or it looked like that. No, they, no. Were, they were pretty young, five yeah. kids, basically, and, like, you could see they were shaking. God knows who sent them there, told them what, you know. I don't know. It looked like they didn't know either. Do you know what has happened with these five guys? Oh, yeah, good question. Actually, I haven't followed, but probably they were arrested and, uh, you know, they were not accused lynched? of a coup plot, probably. Were they lynched by the crowd, or do you know? Oh, uh, no, police took them. Okay. Police took them. That, that yeah. was so, that was one clever thing to do, basically. Prevented the lynch. Police prevented the lynch. Mm. So do you have any idea who sent, I mean, this, it seems like a very chaotic, mm -hmm. crazy situation. And I've heard from others that the crowd, the people, as you say, they were in a way already gathered around in different places. Well, listen, Almost I mean, before the, the, the soldiers uh, were there. Yeah, there are different inf information given. What happened that day, I mean, the Turkish army, we know Turkish army, and Turkish army knows how to run a coup, that's all, yeah. to be honest. So, but, uh, I mean, uh, that night specifically, my show finished at nine. Uh, uh, I went back home first. I got home, then I turned on CNN Turk, and I saw, like, oh, like there are soldiers uh, closing the bridge, the first bridge, the Atatürk Bridge, and I was like, what the... But then, do you know what? Actually, this was being talked about. Uh, the, Fetu, the, 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 the Fetullah supporters within the army, they could plot a coup. Actually, this, this was being talked about. So this was the first thing that came to my mind. I was like, oh, this is probably this Fetullah, whatnot, you know? Mm -hmm. So I directly went back to the channel. This is how it happened. But I don't know. It's, it's really, I think, no, I mean, only very few, few people know what happened really that night. 
because there are different contradicting uh, the you know stories that people tell. So at first, for example, some of the people who saw the incident, they're saying first there were like some soldiers on the bridge. There was nothing, and even some people were supporting them because people did not understand what's really happening. And then, uh, then some people say they saw some vans, white vans, carrying some gu uh, civilians with some guns. So w once they came, then the atmosphere have changed. Then crowds started gathering against the soldiers, whatnot. So it's really chaotic. God knows what happened. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you as a well-known journalist in, in Turkey, have you tried to figure out what happened? Have you sort of used your journalistic uh, experience and uh, uh, well, do you to know, try to find out? Mm -hmm. Actually, no, it... no, not so far. I really yeah. did because it's just like what I feel is we cannot know now because who, who are, everybody's in jail or the coup plotters. And if there was a fair jurisdiction in Turkey, yes, we, we would have learned. But look at the situation. God knows. I mean, we don't know what these people are telling, what really happened. You cannot, like, everybody's in jail. And, the, and actually, the soldiers, uh, you know, the, the ones that were arrested during Ergenekon, Barrios cases, even they don't want to talk. When you want to like, try to talk to them, they're always like off the record, we are well, we'll talk later. That's what they say, actually. These soldiers are really discreet in Turkey. They don't want to say much. It's impossible to understand that the soldiers are the bad guys. Mm. I mean, it's huge groups of people that they're really, they have, the soldier put down the weapon and then it's a huge group of, of party supporters that lynch them mm -hmm. when they are laying down. Of course. And the thing is, remember, Turkish army, I mean, there is the professional branch of Turkish army, but you know, everybody does their military service in Turkey. So most of their guys, they were just doing their military service. Yeah. Young guys. Uh, who just you know went to the army to serve for like a year or, or so and they're killed and God probably most of these guys like 22 year old 21 year old guys they didn't know what was going on how could they they were just simple ranger guys you know well Akın Öztürk is being accused of leading the coup d'etat he's in jail right now uh, well he's being accused of that but we don't know. I mean, yeah. what was Hulusi Akar doing that night? Yeah. It's really a big, big question mark. Yeah. This is interesting also that uh, it was a national investigation mm -hmm. about the uh, coup, but it was closed down quite soon after it was opened and some of the main players were not interviewed at all. How come? How is that possible? Hulusi Akar and... Uh, because now all the system in Turkey is designed to protect only one guy. Uh, which is the head of the state and head of the government and head of the party, AK Party right now, which is Mr. Erdogan. The whole system is designed for that. That's it. So uh, basically nothing is opaque anymore. We don't know anything and it's impossible to learn something. Uh, you know, the state institutions, they don't really give information to anyone, not journalists or not to the citizens. So as I said, probably we're never going to learn unless the regime changes in Turkey, to be honest. Would it be possible to have an uh, international investigation into uh, to understand what happened? Well, like in this situation, not at all, because mm. we don't have free jurisdiction, basically, you know. Uh, we don't have free judiciary system. How is this going to happen? Yeah. It doesn't look good. Even, <laughs> even if there was like a heroic judge yeah. Yeah. or something, or a he yeah. heroic, I don't know, state attorney who wanted to investigate this, you know, the, 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 well, who's going who's gonna to guarantee his safety or her safety? No, I mean, impossible. Do you have any idea how it was planned or who is actually behind it? I mean, international, all the mm -hmm. international uh, secret service bureaus, they say that they are sure that Fetlagen was not behind it. Well, actually, I wouldn't be that sure. Well, not him as a person. Yeah. What I see, actually, he's a senile old person right now and we, we know he has diabetics and whatnot. But though I have been following this Ergenekon Balios cases back in 2006, uh, six seven, as a journalist and I remember back then, the, well this was, yes there was a Fethullahist uh, organization and there were Fethullahist people as a sect. This is both a religious sect and a political sect. And this sect actually had an aim to topple the, the Kemalist uh, secular state, 
this was their aim. So it all started with Ergenekon Barrios cases. I totally remember. And this is when everything started to, uh, you know, topple down, crumble in Turkey. Turkey system started crumbling with Ergenekon Barrios cases. So what happened back then? All this Fethullahist organization uh, within the judiciary system, within the army. So they started acting and it was insane. Uh, hundreds of these soldiers, most of them were war heroes back then, they were being accused of, I don't know, plotting a coup, plotting, bombing the civilians, whatnot. Crazy accusations, crazy. And there was no proof at all. I remember the, 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 the uh, Ergenekon indictment was a joke, but nobody listened to them. All these poor soldiers, poor co commanders, they were like trying to defend themselves, but nobody listened to them because the, 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 the Fethullahist media was really strong and such an atmosphere was created in Turkey. Even if you said, you know, wow, stop, like there are a lot of question marks in this case. What's happening about Ergenekon? If you said this, you will be finger pointed as a coup plotter, as like a, a coup lover. So nobody could say anything. And they put hundreds of people, uh, journalists, soldiers in the jail. And the, the, the only thing these people had in common, they were all secularists. So the system started crumbling down here, and yes, it was obvious. So they changed the system in the army, basically. Uh, not, yeah, maybe not Fethullah himself. But yes, mm -hmm. we know he has diabetes. He's sick, and when you listen to him talk, uh, he sounds delusional. Yes, not probably he himself, but there was the organization. And after Ergenekon Balios cases, th they took over the army. That's a fact. And now, from the Turkish army, nothing left. You know what this. Then it seems like uh, what happened on the 15th of July is a sort of a repetition of the again in Cambalios cases. From a different, from a from a different. Well, the, or? You, well, um, maybe from a perspective, uh, you know, were Kemalists within the army involved somehow? I don't know. Uh, I've talked to some soldiers. I mean, uh, they cannot be clear about that either. I've been talking to some soldiers, you know, like a relatively smaller ranking colonels and whatnot. They're saying like there almost there are no seculars in Turkish army right now. Basically, you know, all the you know top hotshots in Turkish army, they're t trying to show themselves in Friday prayers. That's what, you know, it, the soldiers in the army tell me. So uh, also in the army, it, only the Erdoganists left apparently. I mean, if you're not an Erdoganist in the system, uh, especially within the state, you cannot survive. Two times two, four, that's how it is. Even if you're not an Erdoganist, you have to act like an Erdoganist. He is the new red line. You cannot say anything against him. You have to act wh whatever, as whatever he says. That's the, that's the new Turkish state. Let's be clear about that. Hmm. Um, I've heard that they actually started making the... It must be, and everybody say that it existed lists of who should be arrested mm -hmm. uh, because they started arresting people already two o'clock in the night, you know, on <laughs> 16 of July, mm -hmm. very early. Uh, that the list of who should be arrested, what they started to prepare these lists already in 2008, 2009, and so on. Well, actually, what happened is uh, before all these Ergenekon Balios cases, this is what the Turkish army, I mean, Turkish army was the guardian of the secular system, right? Yeah. So within the Turkish army, they were like really sensitive about this. And actually, regularly, they were checking their members and uh, the radicalists or the fundamentalists within the army were being expelled. So Turkish army has been following its members about this anyway. And actually, they have their own intelligence system within the army. Uh, and of course, the Fethullahists within the army probably were known. It's not an easy, you know, hard thing to find, basically. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really shocked that they had the lists, of course. Everybody knew who was what. I mean, within the media, we know who was Fethullahist, who was not. Because after a point, actually, in the beginning, they were hiding themselves. But then, after the system has changed, people were pl proud to say, like, oh, I'm a Fethullahist. They used to say, Hizmet Hareketi. Uh, well, they, it was like, a, you know, they were like proud, I'm from his met Hareketi. So basically they were out in the open, everybody was saying what they were saying. So. Mm. After the Ergenikon? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, like, in, in, the, in, in that the period, period, yeah, in, in that period, period totally, yeah, yes. Yeah. yes. 
Uh, Fettler Glenn and Adon was good friends for for long mm-hmm. long while and cooperated. Yes, or, because or supported each other. In a of way. course, uh, 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 Fethullah Gülen and Erdogan they had the same goal. They were acting together it was to change the system basically, topple the secular system. And once the system was toppled, Mr. Erdogan did not need Fethullah Gülen anymore. So it was a baggage for him. You know, why carry this baggage? For the rest of your life, so you know, Mr. Erdogan decided to dump this baggage, and that's how all this hustle started. With quite dramatic consequences for hundreds of thousands of people. Yes. Do we know any any numbers of the supporters of the Hizmet? Uh, well, ju- yeah, actually, uh, apparently there were not much, but they were influential within the state. Actually, Fethullah Gülen. Uh, he had all these videos about that. I watched a few of them. It's amazing. So in one of his videos, he was saying, he was saying, uh, Turkish state is confiscated by the Balkan migrants, but we're going to take that back. So what he refers to is, uh, you know, the, the republic was established uh, mostly from the migrants from the Balkans and the Crimea, basically people, Turks who were living in the Balkans and Crimea after the Ottomans were dissolved. They, they came back to Anatolia and they, they were the ones who were active in creating the new secular Turkish Republic. And actually, this is, I mean, probably this is another rift in Turkish society. The secular uh, Turks from the Balkans and more conservative Anatolia. So Fethullah Gülen was referring to that. So he saw the secular state as some sort of an imported European style Thing basically, so this was his aim to change the state anyway. Like he has speeches about that. So actually, if you if you watch his you know previous speeches, it's like out in the open what happened basically, uh, and how he organized. The easiest thing to organize ignorant crowds is by religion, of course. You know, uh, th- th- he started uh, he started his own sect, religious sect, and. His aim, and also in this sect, these young people were being educated and led by this, like go to the state, get into the state ranks, be a bureaucrat. So all these people, they started like getting into the state somehow by hiding themselves, by acting as if they're not followers of Fethullah Gülen, by acting like secularist uh, Turkish citizens. Uh, they got into the state institutions, uh, basically the army, uh, be, uh, like also the uh, the state itself, so that's how it happened. But after, like in the first election, after all this happened, after the rift between uh, Erdogan and Fethullah Gülen was out in the open, as journalists, we were wondering that too. You know, what's going to happen now? Is AK Party going to lose the elections because now it's all you know Fethullah is not supporting anymore? Nothing changed in terms of uh, voter preference. So apparently it was just 1%, 2% of the society, this Fethullah, Fethullah Gülenists, basically, but they were in influential positions. Yeah. Is, it, is it any basic difference? I mean, if uh, let us say that if Fethullah or Hizmet would have taken the power. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's a strange rhetoric. I, I can't really understand this rhetoric all, all the time. You know? mm-hmm. Because Erdogan is saying that uh, Gülen uh, is a fundamentalist and he mm-hmm. wants to make uh, produce a very religious fundamental state, you know, mm-hmm. and these things. But it seems for me like uh, Erdogan is doing just precisely the same. <laughs> uh, is it any basic difference between if you think about these two figures as leading of uh, both their different uh, type of, of organization the, or whatever? How do you say that yeah. they're two sides of a coin, yeah. basically? Yes, they're the same thing. Like they were acting together up until very recently, anyways. Uh, if uh, Gülenists won, what would happen? Let me tell you. Fethullah Gülen would not say anything. They were not going to say it was the Gülenists who took over, whatnot. They, they were, they were always going to hide it. But they would eliminate everybody who were against them in, in time. So basically, for people like me, uh, who are normal, I don't know, who want, who want simple uh, democracy. Uh, we would be eliminated anyway, so our, I don't know, our fate was sealed in a sense. But it didn't seem like, if, you, if you're going back to the 15th of July, that it was a, a serious coup or anything like that. I was in uh, Turkey 15th of July, mm-hmm. watching it on television, and I thought, this is, uh, this is strange, you know, from the beginning you can see this is very, very strange what's going on here. Mm-hmm. And the people are sitting there say, we know what a coup is. Mm-hmm. 
this cannot be a coup. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the Turkish military want to do a coup, mm -hmm. this is not how they do it. They are well organized. It's the largest military in Europe. As far yeah. as we know, uh, MIT has known about all this coup plotting organization within the army. Uh, some soldiers knew about it. Probably, I don't know, these coup plotters were deceived or misled, God knows, by MIT or by uh, other elements within the Turkish army. But yes, for Gulenists, something went totally wrong that night. Of course, I mean, just you send some young soldiers to the bridge. What are you going to achieve? What? Like, if, you, if I mean, if I was a commander who wanted to plot a coup, first of all, I would cut the internet. Basically, no, you know, the sim simplest thing to do. No, I mean, apparently the coup plotters looked like they don't know what they were doing. But as I said, we don't, we don't know actually what really happened. Probably the power structure in Turkey wanted this coup to take place in a sense, a con in a controlled manner. Because uh, I remember Sonar Çapta in Washington Institute, he tweeted, this is the 1979 moment for Turkey referring to Islamic, uh, Islamic revolution in Iran. I think that was a realistic analysis. Uh, in a sense, apparently, some people within the state, some people close to Erdogan knew about all this coup, coup, and they let this coup happen in a controlled manner. And then uh, they used this 15th of July as an excuse to install uh, even a harsher one-man regime. Some people are also comparing it to the fire in the Reichstag mm -hmm. in Berlin. The Crystal Knight. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, af I, 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 what I'm really afraid of is probably we haven't lived the Crystal Knight yet. Yes. To be honest, if you are not an Erdoganist, you cannot find a job. For example, me myself, if there was not Deutsche Welle, uh, I cannot work in another in, in any Turkish uh, media organization. That's impossible. So I mean, what are you going to do? Basically, you you literally cannot find a job. <clears throat> you have to have connections uh, from the government. You have to know somebody who's in the state, close to the palace. That's not what we call. This is the only way you can find a job. And this is why young people, educated people, are fleeing. And isn't this the case? Autocracies. They want ignorant crowds, autocracies, nowhere in the world. They don't like educated crowds at all because it's trouble for them, basically. Ignorance is bliss for autocracies. So they're using the uneducated, you can say in a way, to take down the intellectuals and get rid of them. I mean, isn't this the case? Uh, probably this is not going to sound politically right. But this is what happens because democracy needs effort. Democracy needs education. You have to know as a citizen, you have to decide as a citizen, and you have to show your decision as a citizen. What, this is what democracy is. It takes effort. But on the other hand, as we see all around the world, ignorant masses, they don't want democracy. Also in the US, to some extent, we're seeing this. You know, uh, like an American living in the Midwest, he doesn't want to think, he doesn't want to decide he or she, he just wants to vote for Trump and he just wants Trump to, to decide for him, whatever, you know. He doesn't want to meddle with all these issues. Also in Turkey, I'm talking to Erdogan supporters all the time and it's like what they say is Erdogan built bridges, Erdogan built all these tunnels and this new airport, look at Turkey, everybody is jealous of us. They, they genuinely believe in it because they only watch pro-government TV channel they don't read books, uh, they don't really read information on the internet, they don't know, basically. They don't intend to learn. Uh, they have uh, no uh, intention to learn. So it's, life is very, really easy for them. They don't have to learn. They just vote for Erdogan and Erdogan decides for them. There you go. But the it's not easy for them either to get m different information. Is it because all the channels no, there are true. Erdogan channels, all the papers there are Erdogan papers? True. It's, I mean, you have to search yes. for. So, uh, this is one other, other parallel opinion. with the 30s Germany, in a sense, the propaganda techniques, the propaganda machine, in a sense. It's huge. It's like uh, as smaller media organizations, we are trying to make ourselves heard, but who's going to hear us? You know, you have to search on the internet, go online, whatnot, but when you turn on the TV, uh, the TV is full of Erdoganist propaganda, basically. But Erdogan is saying all the time, 
that you know he's strengthening the, the democracy because he's listening to the people. Mm, yeah, exactly. So the, the 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 description of democracy has been changing in Turkey. Yes, that's the that's one amazing part actually for social scientists, I suppose. So what AK Parti and Erdogan did, they established autocracy by using the discourse of democracy, basically. Yes, they said, we want democracy, we're fighting for democracy. <laughs> they used this discourse to establish a full-blown dictatorship. Amazing, you know. So you say he's not respecting democracy. He's, he's, he's not. He doesn't want to strengthen. He's using democracy, but he's not want to. This is the to this is the new the new style of autocracy. Actually, we see this all, like in Turkey, in Serbia also in the Balkans. All these new generation of autocrats they love elections. What is this rhetoric? Anti-European rhetoric. Well, he has learned. He can play European leaders. He calls Germans and Dutch Nazis. But then two months later, everything is forgotten and German state wants to work with Erdogan. So he has learned he can play anyone. He, he totally knows this. He knows he can say anything he likes, but then they're going to come back to him to trade. You know, uh, so probably Europe should be more critical of itself in a, in a sense. I mean, like you're being called a Nazi, do you understand? I mean, have we forgotten the, 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 what happened in Second World War, all the pain? this uh, national socialism has caused in Europe. So Erdogan is calling Europeans Nazis and Europeans are acting like nothing happened. Isn't this ethically weird in a sense? Before the elections, Ms. Merkel tells Mr. Erdogan she wants to meet him after the election. So she acts like she's sure he's going to be elected and she doesn't even care about the process. And she says she wants to meet. Same for the United States. So. Erdogan has learned to play the international system. But why is he criticizing Europe so harshly? Uh, what is the meaning of this rhetoric? He Because I think Turks, uh, as a Turkish nation, we, we have this complex from the Ottoman times. You know, it used to be a big empire, then it collapsed. And now only, like, only Turkey left. So I think Turks, uh, in, in, their, in their social history, uh, or social, like, in the unconscious, uh, they have this feeling of resentment, I guess, and he's playing playing to that resentment all the time. This makes him gain points within Turkey because people don't follow what happened afterwards. He just yells at Merkel, he just yells at Dutch and the United States in front of cameras, and everybody thinks he's water-based. They think, oh yeah, look at Erdogan, how strong he is. He's like an Ottoman padishah. Well, then he kind of apologizes like in, in, a, in, a, in a manner. And then he talks to Merkel, whatnot, with, Dutch, with the, the, the Dutch again. And he wants these countries to invest in Turkey. But nobody hears about that. So the only thing they hear is Erdogan yelling at Germany. And they feel flattered. Mm. They feel he's a strong man. Exactly. So when I'm talking to the Germans in Turkey, what they were telling me, Erdogan supporters, they were telling me, we came here as a worker, but now we're the, we're the bosses. You know, we own the business and this is because of Erdogan. They believe it's because of Erdogan. It's not because of Erdogan. It's because they're now the third generation there and they're now educated in the German system and they have a place in the German system. This is why they own, the, the, they own their own businesses. But they think it's because of Erdogan. So strange. But isn't it strange that uh, Turkish people living in one of the best functioning democracies in the world, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, why do they support a tyrant and the development of an anti-democratic system in Turkey, where they originally came from? Because, because they're not living in Turkey, they're living in a democracy. It's just like, um, look at this ISIS, for example. ISIS was consisted of Muslims who were living in Europe. They, become, they, they became radicalized in Europe, you know, the, the Maghrebians living in France, and they, they flee to, to Syria, Iraq, whatnot. So it's easy to ask for Sharia once you're living in a democracy. I mean, go live in Iran, see what Sharia is, then tell me what you think. So basically, once you're living in democracy, yeah, it's like okay to have some weird romantic ideas about autocracy, whatnot. Always, I, I tell this to Erdogan supporters in Germany. I say, okay, then come live in Turkey. Why don't you come and live in Turkey? I mean, see it from there. No, they just like living in Germany and then praising Erdogan. A possible scenario here is that uh, his criticism of the West 
uh, basically Europe and US. It's a, it's a part of a development where perhaps Turkey is drawing away from Europe and getting closer to Russia. Mm -hmm. Because we have seen that also, they're buying weapon systems from Russia, which is crazy because it cannot be fit into the uh, defense system they have mm -hmm. uh, in Turkey. So it is a development where Putin and Erdogan is talking more and more to each other. What do you think? Is this a possible development? Uh, well, I mean, I don't think Turkey has a, f a foreign policy prospect. It's just like they're floating. One day they're like this, one day they're like that. It's just like a Turkish... <laughs> Carpet salesman. This is the mentality, basically. You know that in touristic places, carpet salesman. You know they bargain crazy prices. So this is the this is the mentality in uh, Tur Turkish foreign policy these days. I don't think they have a far-fetched vision. I mean, they don't want to leave NATO. They want good relations with the United States, uh, but they don't want to piss off Putin. And I think Mr. Erdogan is afraid of Putin because with the plane incident when the Russian plane was downed by the Turkish armed forces. Afterwards, Turkey had to pay a really high price, uh, to be honest, with the Russian sanctions to Turkey. Uh, tourism was suffering. Uh, Russia was not buying any fruits and vegetables from the Turkish market. So yeah, Erdogan had to pay a high price. So he's afraid of Putin. Like when Putin shows him the stick, he's like, he backs off basically. He doesn't want to piss Putin off. That's another reason. But one thing, actually, there was hypocrisy there. I think back then, this was the only right thing Turkey did because Russian planes were actually uh, always flying over Turkey illegally. And this was like the hundredth time. And Turkey warned Russia as a NATO state, you know, as a NATO country. And, uh, you know, downing the Russian, Russian airplane was not the wrong thing to do. It was the right thing to do, because, you know, to, to give a message. But then NATO did not stand with Turkey any, you know, the United States did not stand with Turkey. Uh, and in a little bit, Turkey was disappointed in this sense. So it's, you know, understandable from point, point of view. It's very strange to see that uh, immediately after the attempted coup d'etat, uh, Turkey and Russia became mm -hmm. very good friends. Yeah. After well, being having a very difficult time for half a year after the true. shooting down of the plane, mm -hmm. right after they could have uh, well, become very good friends. Erdogan, uh, he apologized after a while, after the Russian plane was downed. Turkey had a really bad year with the Russian sanctions and then Erdogan apologized publicly. In a written, written a letter to the pilot's family, whatnot, like made, made an apology. And Turkey-Russia relations start developing. Uh, and yeah, the, allegedly it was Mr. Dugin uh, who told Erdogan a coup, there was a coup happening within the, within the Turkish army. And what, uh, what people say, I don't know, this is another theory, you know, the United States did not know about the coup, other NATO members did not know about the coup because they were not spying on Turkey. This is the discourse, but since Russia was spying on Turkey, they knew about the coup. That's another discourse, I don't know. Which at, at anyway means that Erdogan was warned about it before it happened. Oh, yeah, so this was yeah. said publicly, yeah. actually. So like, about yes, what, what yes, happened. yes. Yeah. Without, it's a good point. Exactly. Without doing anything. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As a well-known journalist in uh, in uh, in Turkey, you had a good position in CNN. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what what happened with you? Uh, what happened is there was the, the Erdogan Trump meeting. And I said, basically, it was a short meeting. I was on live and like covering this meeting. I said it only lasted 23 minutes. And, you know, the, the, there's also translation, whatnot. So basically, they didn't, they barely talked. That's what I said. And as I said this, uh, Mr. Erdogan in Washington, D.C., he warned the CNN uh, reporter there. And then I was uh, basically let go by my boss. So you were fired, actually. Yeah, I was, in a sense, fired, yeah, <laughs> technically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because of the reporting, just, just yeah. that accident, or yes. that situation. Yeah. Yes, wow. yes. Mm. And since, tell me a little bit about how is it to survive as a journalist in Turkey now? Well, I'm... For the <coughs> last mm -hmm. year. Oh, yeah, I'm a freelancer. Uh, I'm writing opinion pieces to newspapers and magazines. Uh, but I'm uh, working for Deutsche Welle Turkish also. I'm doing a weekly online show for Deutsche Welle uh, Türkçe. So what, we, what I do is my, my little online show is called 101. Uh, we invite the people uh, who are influential 
uh, or who are like on the top of the Turkish agenda and we ask them questions and then, uh, you know, I interview them on, uh, on live, online in a sense. Uh, and we're gaining traction because basically Turkish mainstream channels these days, they cannot cover much. It really is dangerous to cover a story these days, you know. Uh, so basically we cover stories, we're doing journalism and actually we're being watched. Uh, I talked to one of the influential Turkish actors who stood against Mr. Erdogan uh, two weeks ago and his video was watched a million times online. So people are watching, it's, it's, it's cool. We're gaining traction and I can, I can do journalism basically. Uh, but if there was not, if I cannot work for Deutsche Welle or any other foreign um, uh, media, I cannot work for Turkish media anymore, basically. I'd be unemployed, to be honest. And uh, practically, when you work as a journalist, uh, do you have sort of uh, invisible lines you don't want to cross? Is, uh, are, you, are there obstacles? Or how there is are. It? are, you, are of course. Uh, tell me a little bit so. Uh, well, yeah, of course. Than it's there to are practical work as a journalist. There are red lines. I mean, uh, no, with with Deutsche Welle, nobody. I mean, uh, we can't cover anything we like, but not to be put in jail. Of course, uh, you've got to be a little bit cautious. For yes, there are red lines. You cannot really bash on Mr. Erdogan too much, uh, or questioning Turkey's Turkey's Syria policy. For example, there are rumors that. Turkey brought all these Uyghurs to fight in Syria. I mean, you cannot really cover a story about that. That would be too dangerous. If you get into the Syria issue, it's a little dangerous. Um, that, so that sort of issues. Or if you wanted to cover a story about Mr. Erdogan's family, for example. This wouldn't end mm -hmm. good for you, that sort of stuff. But for example, there are like... Or money, or money transfers. Money so. transfers, yeah. But yeah. That, like you learn to... But for example, you can bash on a minister. You can bash on a local mayor, whatnot. That's okay. Like you can go with that, basically. Kurdish question: uh, What happened in Sur Jizre? Like, if you want to report about this, it's uh, problematic. In Jizre, back um, like two years ago, when Turkey was, uh, you know, having these military operations about PKK, for example, there was a building. It was full of people. We knew about that. Turkish state was saying. There were terrorists in that very building, but were there terrorists or were there civilians? Were there women, children? Nobody knew. And that building was bombed, in a sense. Uh, like what happened that night there in this building, it's a big red line. We cannot really cover it. You'll be in trouble, basically. What's your uh, inner state of mind when it comes to seeing that so many of your colleagues are being arrested every day? Mm -hmm. Turkey has more journalists in prison than any, and then the rest of the country together, yeah. the rest of the world together. You mm -hmm. know. Um, suddenly you wake up one morning and your colleague is arrested and in prison. And this is happening, you know, we are mm -hmm. getting the phones and we are getting the messages all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what is being here living with this? Uh, True. Uh, I mean, uh, what happens is like, yes, of course, I, I have sleepless nights. I had uh, Mücella Yapıcı on my show. Mücella Yapıcı was a very, very influential woman and architect. She was like one of the uh, leading voices of Gezi movement. Gezi movement did not have any. I, I was a protester also in Gezi. There were no leaders, but he was one of. She was one of the leading voices, like a you know mature lady, an architect, a city planner. She knows like she was talking about all these issues. So I had her on my show the other day, and then I thought you know. Oh my God! I hope they don't like open an investigation about like against us, uh, you know. Since we had her on my show, of course I have these thoughts all the time. But you kind of, I mean, what are you going to do if they want to arrest you? They don't. They don't need an explanation or they don't need an excuse. If they want to arrest you, they'll arrest you. Basically, one good thing is, I mean, good in quotations. What they do, for example, with, journal, with journalists like me, I was an anchor for CNN Turk. You know, the. Uh, People were watching our news ballots and whatnot. Now I'm in a sense marginalized. I'm fired from CNN Turk. I'm working for Deutsche Welle Türkçe, uh, which is now, uh, you know, strengthening its its strength against like a Turkey operation, just newly. So it's it's like new. Not many people know about that. Not many people watch Deutsche Welle Turkish. So what they did is they they marginalized me and people like me. So. Uh, it's only opposition who are following us and listening to us. I'm not really talking to their waters, so I'm not a danger anymore. So this is one thing that relieves me. Probably they will not arrest me because of that, at least. 
But you mentioned Gessie. Why are they going after Gessie demonstrators now, mm -hmm. five years afterwards? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, this is the system. Erdogan needs enemies all the time, basically. This is how he wins the elections. It's either the United States, it's either uh, Europe, or it's like enemies within, you know, who are Kurds sometimes, who are seculars sometimes. Um, and for a period, he's chosen this Gezi protests, basically. And it's like he's showing the stick to the people. Basically, like, you know, we can arrest you anytime, basically. He's also a big threat to all Turkish society, basically. It's just, a, everybody's living in fear, in a sense. Yeah. Um, what kind of um, scenarios do we have here? I expect more authorita authoritarianism, to be honest. It's going to be much worse. Um, opposition is meaningless. They're void. There's no opposition, you know. Uh, so, no, yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be much worse before it gets better. That's what I think. Is it possible for Europe to have any other stand here, or another position, take another angle toward the Turkish situation than what they have done? We talked about Russia-Turkey relationships and why is Mr. Erdogan so timid and so careful towards Mr. Putin? Because Mr. Putin applied sanctions on Turkey. Uh, on the other hand, I understand Western leaders, when you talk to Europeans, European bureaucrats or MEPs, they're saying, listen, what can we do? I mean, he's a legitimate leader, he's being elected all the time. Turkish people want him, it's not our place, uh, you know, to talk against Turkish people, what not. We're going to work with this guy. I understand this stance. But let's remember what is European Union and what is uh, European values are about. What are European values are about? Let's talk about that again, if you like, all of us together. Because once you start turning a blind eye on authoritarianism, it's going to come and catch you also in the end. We're sharing the same world. And you, Turkey is, like it or not, Europe's neighbor in a sense, let alone being a candidate. You, you cannot displace Turkey. Turkey is here. It's always going to be just next to Europe. So uh, do you really want to work with an autocrat as, as Europe? You know, having, the, having created European principles, Western principles, principles of the democracy, human rights. Do you want to work with an autocrat? That's, that's a question. That's an ethical question I think Europe has to ask uh, itself. I understand being pragmatist and I understand being a politician. You know, yes, Turkey is a big market. Probably there are investment opportunities. I understand. And it's sometimes... As an investor, it's easier to work with an authoritarian guy. You know, you can reach him with a one phone call, get your thing done. You know, it's easier. You don't have to go through all this bureaucracy, whatnot. Yes, this is a pro in a sense. But then, as I said, you know, Turkey is your neighbor. If you let this authoritarianism grasp even more power, it's, it's going to hit back to you. That's what happens. Um, it's not only near to us, it's an ally. I mean, Turkey's quote unquote ally, yeah. <laughs> it's a part of NATO. Yeah. yeah. It's a strange thing, you know, that um, we are receiving, not only Norway, but all mm. the European countries, we are receiving thousands and thousands, you know, more than 200,000 uh, mm. refugees from Turkey. Uh, and we accept their situation and we give them the right to stay as uh, refugees mm -hmm. in our countries, uh, which means that we are accepting that there are under... There is a problem. There's a problem in this yeah. country. But at the same time, we don't say any... Or the politicians don't say anything about... True. It's a, it's a double moral here, which is really true. True. strange to And do you know, I mean, it's not really easy to be a refugee, refugee. I mean, imagine me, I'm like almost 37 right now. I had... I have a career here. Like, if I, if I flee to Norway, what am I going to do? Be an Uber driver? Like, start all over again from zero? Start a career from zero? It's, 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 not like, it's not like, oh, all Turks want to flee to Europe. No, I mean, we have to go to Europe because we have to. It's not the easiest thing. Leave everything behind and start from zero with zero networks. On this world, this is the hardest thing to do, basically, you know. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the grave consequences of authoritarianism. People have to flee and start from zero in, under really harsh, hard conditions. I was once talking to this uh, French investor fund manager, actually. And uh, so what he was saying, we were talking about politics, and he said, 
it was like a business lunch and he said uh, well you know uh, at the end of the day it's like every society is, has its own characteristics and for example French we they fought for democracy they had the French Revolution they stood against authoritarianism and dictatorship or not so you know Turkey did not do this Turkey has to do this also but then I thought you know uh, the situation with French Revolution can you imagine the technology and the surveillance the state has these days even in France can you imagine having another French level revolution with, the, with this level of t technology and surveillance? It's impossible. If th the same conditions were today, they, there wouldn't be any French revolution, basically. I mean, you can be listened, uh, you can be followed by the state step by step, basically. It's not easy to, you know, start a the movement against the authoritarian regime and rise it. Like, like it, it, it is not easy to be a Jean d'Arc these days, you know. Yeah, it's... Cool to have romantic ideas, whatnot, but no, think, things that, that don't work that way on the field. I think that's a very, very important comment because it tells us how difficult it can be to be in opposition in a way or protesting against uh, something which is very unfair. Oh, like States. what Mr. Erd this new regime, what Mr. Erdogan does actually. So basically, if there is a potential op strong opposition figure against him, this person is put in jail or eliminated or marginalized somehow. So he just keeps uh, a you know domestic opposition in a sense, on a, like not dangerous opposition for him. Let's be honest about this. You know, the CHP is not a threat for him. CHP cannot win elections. CHP is not that effective. CHP has its own water base, which is, say, 30% at most, and just like playing in their own field, basically. It's okay for Erdogan. But if there was an opposition figure, like there have been uh, politicians who could be potential threats uh, against Erdogan, they were eliminated one by one. That's how it works. And uh, especially he has eliminated people from his own ranks. Of course. I mean, everybody so starting AKP together with him, yeah. they are all kicked out now. Of course. AKP in 2002 is a, a totally different structure from AKP today, basically. Mm. I think that's important too, that the changes of, of the Of very important. Mm. AK Party is now, AKP is consistent of Erdoganists. When AKP was first formed, there were like Islamists within AK Party centrists, you know, center-rightists, mm. a, a couple socialists even, uh, you know, these people were in the AK Party ranks. They all, they were promising something new, like a new understanding of democracy, whatnot. Some people bought this, some people did not buy it, but like in time, Erdogan eliminated everyone he doesn't like within the party, basically. All these people, all these big guns, hotshots uh, in the AK Party back then are now sidelined. Uh, but also these people, I mean, they're all, you know, partners in crime in a sense. They cannot stand against Erdogan because this Erdogan owns the state mechanism. He knows everything about everyone. So it's not really easy to come up against him mm. in the system. But he must be, in one way, must be afraid of some of them because they know a lot. They must know a lot. But Erdogan knows a lot about them too. Basically, so this is what I'm saying. They're like partners in crime. Like yeah. They know a lot about each other. Yeah, right. Also in Norway in the 30s, no, not in the 30s, uh, but in Norway we talk about 42, 45, under the Second World War, we had uh, escape routes going, you know, out of Norway mm -hmm. to Sweden because Sweden was an independent country. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing now. We mm -hmm. see from Turkey, people are establishing escape routes. Mm -hmm where they fly over the mountains or across the sea or especially across the river. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, M M Merich River to yeah. Greece, yes, there had been incidents, yes. I well, I mean, I think what happens is rather, yes, if there is like, if these people are under surveillance, if they're like close to Gulenist organization, mm -hmm. yeah, they have to flee. Some doesn't have passports, their passports are confiscated. But uh, I think, yeah, but, but the others are just, the fleeing by planes basically yeah. through legal means seeking asylum I think this is rather the case for Turkey right a lot of people are going both ways mm. some are going straight out with, uh, with, uh, with planes even flights mm -hmm. but a lot of people are fleeing across the true the yeah and there had been instance even like a yeah. couple months ago a baby died drowned in this river yeah. their family was trying to escape yeah my friend, he's also said that he often wakes up five o'clock in the morning because he knows that's the time when the police <laughs> is coming, knocking your door, 
in a way, you know? It's not five anymore because actually, <laughs> according, to, according to law, it's dawn time. Like when, no, it's like yeah. when the sun is rising, it's oh, yeah. going to law. Oh, yeah. They come to arrest people. So now, you know, uh, Mr. Erdogan played with times in Turkey. <laughs> yeah. So the sun rises at nine in Turkey. So probably they're going to come around 8.30. So like you can have a nice sleep. <laughs> <laughs> You can sleep. But have you packed your suitcase? Are you <laughs> no, actually what I think yeah. is I have this, uh, I have my dog I got from a shelter. Yeah. So I sometimes think, you know, who to leave the dog, like <laughs> if they come to, and like I talked to a couple of friends, can you take care of her? <laughs> like, because basically, you know, it's seriously, there's a dog and it has to be fed and like taken care of, basically. This is one thing I have been arranging. <laughs> Because you're not allowed to bring the dog to the prison. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> If that was the case, I wouldn't mind going to prison at all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anything we have forgotten? Anything we should uh, add? Yeah, no, I think something no. You want to, you, no. Something you want to? No, no. You want to say? To your no, no. I said everything. Probably much more than I should say. <laughs> <laughs>